Today I'm going to be filming a video, uh, this is going to be a follow-up video, a, a little bit more of a, uh, a casual video, um, to uh, my mo most recent video about uh, ranked choice voting. And at the end of that video I talked about uh, how, uh, how the, an, on, a criticism of ranked choice voting that, in, that is often brought up is that it would be logistically uh, impossible to implement on a, on a large scale, such as for uh, United States elections, um, because the the amount of resources would just be way too much, or it would have to be use a, a, an electronic voting system, which um, is not a good idea. Um, but today I'm going to be sort of... Um, in a, a more casual setting, sort of just uh, outlining how, uh, a, sort of more of a proof of concept. So nothing in here is, I'm I'm not saying, the, the things that I'm saying in this video are not necessarily things that I'm saying this is how the system absolutely should work, but just how the system could work, sort of some examples. And so um, I'm going to just be walking you through how I see a ranked choice voting system possible in the United States. Uh, and this could apply to really anywhere, but I'm going to be focusing on the United States for this video. Uh, so I'm just going to start from the very beginning, um, which is how candidates would get on the ballot. Uh, by the way, for the first part of this video, I'm not really going to be utilizing this space, so I apologize, but I only have one camera, so I can't really uh, uh, show my face. I apologize. So let's start with how candidates would actually go about getting on the ballot, because one of the important things about ranked choice voting, if we were going to combine the, the uh, general election and primary election, there would be a lot of candidates on the ballot. That would be candidates from, you know... Th all the major parties, plus probably some independents, and people would be more inclined to run because if they have less support, they, the ranked choice voting makes it m more f feasible that someone would end up voting for them, even if it it doesn't actually increase their their chances of winning necessarily, because of course they they still do need a majority uh, majority support, the first one to have majority support, which you know if you're a, a very small candidate it probably won't happen. So what we Really, I would say 10 candidates is like the feasible limit for a ranked choice voting system because one of the important things about a voting system is you want it to be very, um, e you want it to be easy for the voters. Um, you know, you want it to be easy and transparent and clear what's going on. If you ask the voters to choose between like 20 candidates, it's, it's way too much, and it sort of defeats the whole purpose of the system. And it makes the tabulation of the votes uh, very uh, difficult and time-consuming. So what we want to do instead is, I would say, 10 limits, t 10 candidates should be the absolute maximum. So I would say the first thing you should do, as, as is currently implemented in the U.S., I believe, uh, is candidates would have to get a, a petition signed. But I think the the limit, the the uh, minimum for signatures should have to be quite a bit, maybe like, I don't know, 100,000. Obviously, you could probably find, for a major candidate, you could probably find 100,000 people that would be theoretically willing to sign the, the form, but I don't know if 100,000 people would actually go through the effort of actually doing it. Not that it's that much effort, but uh, lots of people don't like doing that sort of thing. <laughs> but 100,000 is sort of just... Uh, a number I just came up with off, off the top of my head. As I said, this is more of a proof of concept. The actual details would have to be figured out with actual experts who know what they're doing. Um, but the other thing that you could do when you're doing petitions is you could have a uh, you, you could have a minimum number of signatures required from each state, uh, and that would sort of, kind of be. Um, uh, a way to like incorporate a bit of the electoral college in in the system for people that um are that still really are in favor of the electoral college that could be sort of a 
uh, sort of a consolation, a, I wouldn't say a compromise, because it's completely not the Electoral College, but it's sort of a way of including some tradition. Um, and I think there is merit to having um, some some appeal guaranteed from uh, from all states. Um, but then in addition to the petition system, you'd probably also want, um, each candidate, if we wanted to guarantee that there were 10 candidates on the ballot, 10, 10 or fewer candidates on the ballot, then we'd have to have, um, polling. So you'd probably want like, uh, 10, uh, t candidates to reach 10% in polls. And, and obviously you'd have to have some checks in place to make sure that the polls are legitimate polls, um, because you can always fudge the results, but it's also it also always when you try to have uh, government like ha having requirements directly off of the media that can get you know raise some some questions about freedom of speech and and whatever which which are um, legitimate concerns. So th there would need to be some uh. So, some requirements in place for what constitutes a valid poll, but you'd probably need to reach 10% in a few different polls, and maybe maybe some, some statewide polls as well, again, as a sort of way to, to bring in elements of the Electoral College. Um, but once we ensure that there are only 10 candidates on the ballot, oh, and by the way, this entire system uh, probably would have to be done, uh, obviously we're just doing one election, so there, there's no reason the election has to be, you know, a Tuesday, the first Tuesday in November or whatever it is. Um, I I think it would be ideal to have like a week long, but that's uh, obviously a lo uh, a burden for um, poll workers and whatever. Um, people say that you know election day should be a federal holiday, and I definitely agree. But I think maybe what we could do is, for example, have it over a weekend, like. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and then Monday is the, the federal holiday, but you can vote early if you want, but the, the candidates have to be on the ballot quite early, and there's not too much of a risk of them dropping out, because if they already have 10% support, and people aren't going to be voting strategically, so they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be holding back any other candidates' campaign, so there's not too much of a risk of them dropping out, um, but pretty much we want the candidates to be uh, firmly on the ballot beforehand because of the way that voting happens. So the way I see voting happening is I think it is actually election, uh, you know, e-voting machines should be used because it makes the actual voting process uh, for the voters easier. However, they should not be used, it, the, the digital totals should not be used to actually count the votes because um, um, e-voting is, in, in high states elections, and uh, the U.S. election is arguably the highest states election in the world, um, in very high states elections, you, you, you really can't trust a machine with the outcome because there can be bugs, there can be, um, you know, even if you have the operating system completely locked down from the beginning, because a lot of voting machines nowadays, you can literally plug a USB stick into and, you know, tamper with the software. That's obviously bad. But even if you, if you eliminate that, um, that element of it and have it, you know, no, no, uh, firmware updates, uh, available once once the machines are constructed, there's still the potential for bugs. There's there's so many places for the for the system to go wrong where humans can't don't have the ability to be checking. And I'll leave some links in the description of more uh, of more in depth looks at e voting and why it's a bad idea. But for the actual voters on election day, I think it actually is a good idea. So here's how I um, see that working. So in in places which can afford you know, which are densely populated enough where a voting machine made sense. Obviously, for mail-in votes, it's not going to be possible. And obviously, if you live in, you know, a random, you know, really remote area in Alaska, a village in Alaska with like 10 people for miles, then a, a voting machine probably doesn't make sense. But for the vast majority of Americans, they should be using polling machines. So here's how I foresee that working. Pretty much... All the candidates would be listed on the machine. 
uh, by the way, you know, elections also happen uh, with, um, there are uh, federal elections and congressional elections, and I'll talk about that in a little, in a little bit, but pretty much um, all, all the elections that are going to be using the system uh, should be, pr- probably every, every uh, election should be diff- using a different ballot. So at the end, the voting machine is going to print out your ballot, and it should probably print out multiple ballots for the different elections that you're voting in. So just for the sake of example, let's just call this the presidential election. So you have, for when you when you go to vote, the, the screen you're confronted with is, first of all, randomized, which helps to, because when you have so many candidates on the ballot, it is feasible that, you know, some people would just see the first one and and go for it and you want the you probably want the ballot to be standardized so you can't just well you you could feasibly randomize the ballots but i i don't for the the counting process that's probably would would not work so when they walk into the election booth pretty much they just have you know all the candidates on screen right and they are randomized, which I only realized just now that they should be randomized. So, uh, what letter? That's is that correct? I hope that's correct. That's a B. Sorry about that. So, uh, when you walk in, this is what you see essentially, and it says, you know, tap your first choice, and maybe. Uh, we, you know, you, we could discuss the merits of having, you know, little blurbs about the candidates or photos of the candidates. I think photos would actually be reasonable, um, so that you know who you're voting for. Obviously, if you're, you know, the, for, for the uninformed voters, I think it could go either way. A photo could help, so you're like, oh, yeah, that person, I really liked what they said at the debate, but, you know, I just didn't know their name. Or you see the photo and, you know, you just vote on a whim based on, you know, their looks, which obviously is not good. And in terms of having a blurb, probably that is not a good idea because, you know, you don't want it to just be, like, literally an ad. Um, and so it's, it raises the question of who actually writes that. But... Um, you know, and th- there could be certain requirements, but probably uh, a blurb would <laughs> not be a good idea. But anyway, you know, you tap your choice. Okay, I want D. And then D goes away, and it's a second choice, right? And you tap it, and then B goes away, and then and then you tap in order. And you can tap as few or as many candidates as you like. If you just want to vote for one candidate, that's fine. But if you want to vote for a lot of them, then you absolutely can. And then what it does is you know, it prints out your ballot. It doesn't even store the information. All the voting machine is doing is just to print out the ballot. And it just prints it out like this. And, you know, your orders, your your choices in order, and it just prints them out, and then you hand this into the uh, election official or whatever uh, to cast your vote. And that is pretty much how it works. So the voting machine just works as an auxiliary method. And for those, ma- and we have to get all the votes ultimately in this format. And what we we also want to, it's very vital that this printout is exactly what the um, what the vote counters are using, because you know you could you could say here's your here's your vote, please verify that it's correct. Oh, and also here's this QR code that, you know, um, that will scan to actually tabulate the vote. But we don't, or or here's this encoded whatever to make it easier for the computer to, to, to read. But we don't want that. We want the voter to be actually verifying the actual thing, the, the very exact text that is going to, to affect, to, to, to play into the election. That is what makes this, a system like this, really pretty much foolproof um is to to be working off the exact same piece of the paper right the exact same ink is being used 
by the voter to verify that their vote did in fact print out correct. Because if we have this QR code, you never know. Maybe there's some malicious code that's running on this on this machine somehow, and it's print it says, "Yep, this is what you vote for." But then the QR code says something completely different. So we don't want something like that to be able to happen. Always, 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 we want this to be what's uh, what's on there, uh, to be to be what's going to the election officials. Now, as I said, for those for those more more rural areas where it just would not make sense to to send a voting machine, you could have the classic ranked choice voting matrix, which is like, you know, it lists all the candidates down the side, and I know I'm using the same piece of paper that's supposed to be an F, and then the choices across the top, and you know, you fill in the boxes, uh, but this is. Um, you know, when you have 10 candidates, that, that's a lot, you know, it's a, it's pro- probably a, a small piece of paper. It's, it's a lot to keep track of. So you probably don't want to use this as much as you possibly can. And also the candidates are in a set order. And then the, the vote tabulation centers will still have to convert this into this format because all the machines ultimately have to be reading this format. But in the areas where this doesn't make, where, uh, you know, a, a machine doesn't make sense, you could just go with the, you know, the paper mail-in ballot, um, and it, it would work. Okay, so pretty much, once you have your vote submitted, then this is what you've given to the, um, to the, um, the election officials. Um, well, it's really just this, and um, all of them, all of these are from all the people, all the ballots are stacked up in a big thing, and they drive over in a truck or something to the vote tabulation center, and, you know, it, it would take a while, but, I mean, we have, you know, the, the postal service, which can feasibly transport mail to anywhere, um, so it, it might take a little while, but... I, I don't think um, logistically transporting all the votes is really too big of a deal. And then eventually it will go over to the, what I'm calling the Vote Tabulation Center, or VTC, as I may refer to it, but I probably won't. Uh, um, and pretty much the idea, so, so here's the thing. When you vote, there are a lot of elections that you're voting for. Um, you could be voting for president for governor, for senator, for representative, um, and then you, and then you're also voting for, so, well, governor is a state office, but the state, when you vote in your state, the entire state votes for the same president, for the same governor, and for the same senator, and then with your, with your district, but the districts are fairly large, um, for this, for a, representative but then there's your state senate and state rep and then there's your municipal elections like mayors and then there's ballot questions uh, you know referendums on di- on different things so it's a lot of things on the ballot um i think that it would be the the system should be made in a way that that states that want to I don't think states should be required to because it's their government. Um, but states that want to use this ranked choice voting system, the, the federal system, I think should be able to for Senate and governor and whatever, um, if they want. And if they do, you know, that's a lot of elections. They, they don't always happen all at once, but that could be a lot of elections. So it raises the question of how... Where are these vote tabulation centers going to be? Is there going to be one in every congressional in every U.S. congressional district? I think that probably makes sense. And then your presidential ballot and your senator ballot and your governor ballot, if your state wants to use it, because the whole state's voting for the same governor, um, and your representative, because there would be one per district. I actually think it's okay to have more than one vote tabulation center per district, uh, to, per. Uh, you know, congressional district, like in the, in Montana, which has, I believe, one or one or two uh, congressional districts, right? It's 
that's a huge amount of area to be covered by just one vote tabulation center. So probably you would want, I don't know, four or five. Um, but um, for the and then obviously your your the the more local elections, it's going to be difficult to get those to where they're supposed to be. Um, and that is a conversation to be had. But for now, let's just focus on those four elections. President, governor, representative, and senator, um, which all people in your congressional district, your U.S. congressional district within your state, are going to be voting for the same on the, on the same ballot for those things. So let's just focus on that. So let's call this the presidential election. So now we get to the counting, and I'm just going to talk about the process first, and then I'll run the numbers of the actual feasibility of this. So, when you get in, when the ballots come in to the vote tabulation center, essentially here is how I picture it. There's like a bunch of, you know, stations I mean, I don't know if these would be, like, real, like, permanent buildings. It, it would probably just be, like, a, you know, a high school gym, like most, um, like most elections take place in high school gyms. Um, you know, and there would be all these stations. Now, at each station, for, for, from now on, I'm going to be talking about instant runoff voting, and I will get back to Condorcet voting in a bit. But I'm going to just talk about instant runoff. So for e at each station, at each one of these, right, this is a high school gym, and at each one of these, you get something that looks like this. And um, ideally, there would be, like, three people at every station, but the thing is that machines are checking everything. It is vitally important that it is that way around. The machines are checking the humans, not the humans checking the machines, because humans checking the machines... Um, it opens the door for the humans to just be like, yeah, that's that looks right. But when the humans are actually doing out all of the work and the, the machines are just confirming that there is no malicious intent, that is a much more secure system. And again, those machines should be running on code that was made by the federal government in a room with hundreds of people from the ground up. And once it's packaged and sent out to the individual VTCs, um, no one should be able to access it or change it. If candidates have dropped out, the machines should be able to deal with that, but candidates can't join. It should know what to expect. If there's some firmware problem, well, there shouldn't be because large-scale tests should be conducted. So so the individual vote counters should not be able to tamper with the machines in any way. But because of, the, because of those machines, we can allow individual uh, vote, vote tabulators to be... Probably not by themselves. I still think um, it's good to have two people at at a cent at a station. You know, ideally you'd have like one right leaning person and one left leaning person. But obviously, in some places, that's just not going to happen. It's honestly fine. But pretty much what you have is this, and it's a table, and essentially I'm one of the vote counters now. And you have a table with boxes, this is for instant runoff voting, for, with boxes for each candidate. Um, and when you feed in a ballot, it, the, the box physically checks, reads the data on the ballot, and makes sure that you've put it in the correct box. So, when all the ballots come in, you get something like this. And the vote, uh, the vote tabulators take all the ballots, and they say, okay... That one goes in B, that one goes in C, and as you're putting it in, it's checking. It's saying, is C first? Yep. And C is not eliminated? Yep. So yes, you are supposed to put it in C. If I put this one, which is supposed to go in B, in D, it'll just make some sort of a noise, and I'll be like, oh, whoops, I meant to do this. But if there's some, if I keep trying to put it in there, right, if, if I am, if Th there seems to be some malicious intent, then it will alert someone higher up to try to deal with that. And if for some reason it's saying, if I put it in D B and it's like, nope, this isn't correct, I can be like, 
what and then i can you know call over some some um uh, official to to check uh to try to sort it out maybe they'd put it in some at some special box for the votes that for some reason can't be read because they were printed weirdly or folded up or whatever but pretty much you just put it in the box that is correct and i'm doing this and the person next to me is checking to make sure this is correct so i'll be like b is on the top b is not eliminated yet okay d is on the top d is not eliminated yet okay c is on the top and i do all of them and i put them in all their respective boxes and now what i do we go back to here, right? And we have all of the individual vote tabulating uh, stations, essentially, within this high school gym or whatever. <laughs> and essentially, in groups, they they report to one person. And as you're as you're putting in t in the um, in the um, as you're putting in the the things the the ballots into the boxes, they're counting. So, you know, when I put when I put one in, it counts up to one. I don't know if you can see that. That's a one. And then I put it in, and then it says, nope, that's two. I mean, obviously, it would be a digital counter. And then, ideally, right, you'd have a mechanical backup as well. And you maybe, like, one of those, like, things that they have at amusement parks, right? You can just buy them at Staples, like, just those, those you know, counter things. And you just have one of those. And you're counting that one up, too. Um, because what you want is redundancy. You don't want, again, if somehow this machine was maliciously coded to, you know, backtrack the numbers randomly or something, right? To, to like, randomly, at, at random points, like, subtly just, like, reduce the number a little bit to try to tamper with the election, right? You want the, the as much backup as possible. Um... Maybe you'd have the the machine take up its own mechanical counter in addition to a digital counter, right? And maybe you have right the per the person who's checking have have their phone open and like have some app open, not not a proprietary app made by the election committee, but literally just like a standard like counter app and just like counting them all up. You want as much redundancy as you possibly can. Um, and then what you do is you confirm that all your numbers match up. <laughs> And so we have two votes for C and four for D and seven for B and 22 for A, whatever. And and then you report those numbers to this person. And there's one of these person, one of these people for each of these little groups within within this uh, vote tabulation center. And you report your number to this person and the person writes it down, right? And takes out, you know, a standard calculator and, you know, adds up the numbers and then says, hey, everyone else, take out your own calculator. It wouldn't be a phone because you can't have phones in the thing, but it would literally say, like, bring your own calculator, which would be good f so that you know that the election, election, elections calculators, the election, like, committee's calculators aren't, like, all bugged or something. But then again, you could bring in your own calculator that could be bugged with something, that, and that could mess up the election. So, I don't know. Um, again, this is where an expert would be necessary to determine how to actually do this. But again, the idea is everyone checks, and every, everyone at the station is like, oh, you got this for A, I got this for A, okay, type it in. And everyone, and then the you know this person is coming around and showing each person, right? D is is this what you got for for um for a is this what you got for whatever and and everyone can like confer and say yes this th this all made sense we we approve these numbers okay and then these right these people come together so this is what i'm saying we don't all need this one central location where all the votes are tabulated you can tabulate it in separate locations and then just you know you know, funnel it more and more concentrated. And then this person, you know, counts up the votes and between these three election officials, and they're like, yep, that's good. And then the entire vote tabulation center eventually comes up with one final total for every single candidate, right? And these are... <laughs> we can see who won. But that's important, right? It's And then th these numbers are then sent to a federal... Um, 
uh, it could be to a state uh, a state um you know type um operation and then that gets sent to federal i don't i don't really know um but somehow it gets it gets to federal and again the method you know e voting where you're you're transmitting like every individual ballot over over you know the internet there's a lot of room for interference there but when you're talk when you're talking about just the final totals transmitting those right you transmit them over you can transmit them over the internet maybe transmit them over the phone right um or over like a wired in modem or whatever um and maybe just as a backup transmit them through mail as well so after the entire election is over you can just verify that yes indeed the number that came in from each vote tabulation center was in fact the one that they meant to send out but like when you're dealing with just a couple numbers like the, the Yes, there could be man on the middle attacks or whatever, and people could f- f- foreseeably view the totals, which would not be ideal. You don't want people to see because then they, they can sort of see the progress, and if they're interested in tampering, which isn't very easy because, again, the, the machines are checking every single number, every single ballot you put in. But if you are interested in tampering and you figure out some way to do it, right, it would be helpful if you you know, if you had the information, uh, so you know how much to tamper, essentially. But, so we want to try to keep that secret, but if it gets out from a few vote centers, like, it's, it really won't affect much, probably. So, but somehow, right, you, you send over these numbers, and then the federal, you know, uh, election commission or whatever takes all those numbers in and tallies them up, right, and they say, all right, from the entire country, we got 67 for A, and we got 512 for B, and we got 34 for C, which makes no sense, but, you know, and then we got 5 for D. Okay, and then they say, okay, so D is eliminated. And then they send back to everyone, right? Hey, everyone, D is eliminated. Actually, for the sake of example, I wanted to eliminate A, so let's just pretend that that was... 100 something and that was 340 and okay i actually wanted to eliminate a oh and we're also going to change that because i have a point okay uh but okay so let's say we um they say okay everyone a won uh a a A had the fewest votes so we're going to eliminate them and they send that back out to all the vote tabulation centers and then they make an announcement within the vote tabulation center and they say hey everyone a uh got the fewest votes we're going to reallocate their votes. Okay. Now, remember, within this individual vote tabulation center, A did not get the fewest votes. But that doesn't matter. What matters is federally, they said A got the fewest votes, so A will be eliminated. Okay. So we go back. And again, within this individual vote station, A did not get the fewest votes. But federally, right? If you want to be talking about (laughs) being part of something bigger than yourself, this is it, right? Um... And so you say, okay, so now let's, you unload the A box, and you say, okay, well, A is eliminated, so B is next, and you put it in the machine. The machine reads down, it gets to A, and it says, oh, A is out. It doesn't read your X, it doesn't want to, you know, because you could, you could fake that, but it says, it reads, and it says, okay, A was first, but A is out, so yes, B is, in fact, the correct one. And you put in X, this one, and you put this one into C. Okay. And the machine says, yep, that's good. And the, uh, the totals are updated, whatever. And and then, you know, back. Whoops, that was... Sorry about this. <laughs> and again, back. And, you know, you send all the totals, and you send all the totals, and, and it goes back, and okay. And the process repeats, and they say, okay, this time B is eliminated. Okay, so you go... And you say, okay, C is next, and then you eliminate B, and you give that to D. And this one, you say, oh, A was actually already eliminated, so we're going to give that to D. And this one, they just wrote B, and that was their first and only choice. So this ballot is just thrown out because there are no more uh, valid choices there. And whatever. And then, you know, you find a majority, and that's the system. So you don't need it to be all central. Uh... 
you just you just need you do need some central operation that's that's calculating this right ideally with a lot of people with a lot of you know standards calculators that you buy from the store you don't want proprietary stuff you just want to take the thing and write it out on a whiteboard and everyone in the room right you have you have uh representatives from from all the different campaigns essentially and parties and whatever and media and whatever right they can't release this information until the election is done but when the election is done and the results are released right there are cameras over every single i mean i don't know how feasible this is but cameras over every single vote counting station like and it's just released to the public right like every anyone who wants can literally look at this information and say yes in fact that this person that the the you know i mean are people going to go through the hours of footage from every single station? No. But th the point is it's possible. And you and you have officials that are verifying it, but you also have anyone who wants. Just spot checking, right? Um, to see that, you know, everything worked as planned. Um, so, but again, that only happens once the election is complete so that you can't see the progress of the election as it's happening. And by the way, you know, with the Electoral College, elections can be pretty exciting because, first of all, we have pretty much instant results, right? It's pretty much the night of or in into the early morning after that we pretty much know who's going to win. And it's exciting to see, like, individual states, like, go one way or the other, right? It, it really, like, appeals to our, like, gamification of, of uh, things. And, you know, that, that's definitely nice. Um, but of course, it's also important to remember that, you know, politics isn't all about making things into a game. And if, if you, you know, want it to actually be the best system, then, you know, it's very possible that that won't end up happening. So, you know, we can make, do other things to make it exciting. Yes, the, it will be a long wait. I would say that's totally, it's totally worth the wait, but it, <laughs> it will be a long wait for the result but when we do get the results we can make it exciting right we can like like in the at the federal election commission in dc you know they can like open the door and like have confetti and be like such and such one right and then they release whatever the the footage that you know of, of everything immediately after so everyone can start checking but like you can make it exciting that was just an aside point because uh i i did realize that that you know, it's not like a huge consideration, but, you know, it, it could be important. Okay, so now I just want to move on to Condorcet, and if you don't know what Condorcet is, um, I'll, I'll briefly explain it here, but uh, you can also check out the Wikipedia page uh, linked in the description. Pretty much, it works on a matrix, uh, and the way it works is it, it uh, prioritizes the candidate that wins the most uh, or, or actually all, because we're dealing with, you know, we're, we're taking it from a ranked choice, right? In theory, in Condorcet, you could, you know, specify a winner of every individual matchup between two and, two, you know, two and two, which would allow you to have loops. But in real politics, that would never happen. Loops are like in rock, paper, scissors, where rock beats paper, paper beats scissors, and then scissor beats rock. But, like, you would never have a voter that chooses, right, Trump over Biden, then Biden over Warren, but then Warren over Trump. Like, the, it, 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 it always is a hierarchy when you're talking about real voters. So that that's not really an issue. So I think it should work out, if my understanding is correct, it should work out that we can use a traditional Condorcet method with no problems, but maybe we'd have to use another one that sort of deals with some of the problems that sometimes arise depending on exactly how it works. But pretty much the way it works is to take it from a, uh, a ranked choice ballot to Condorcet, you would take the first one, and B, B wins against, B wins over A, over C, over D. So this down the side is the, the like, it's this over this. And you put a 1 in the column if this wins, or a 0 if, if they lose. So B would win against everyone, so we would go, um, uh, I'll just put it small in the corner here, because I actually need to reuse this, but... Right, one, 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 and then you put zero, zero, zero down the side, right? Um, you, you can't see this color very well. 
Let me try a different one. Um, hopefully that's better, yeah. Okay. So there's, and then you go to the next choice, and they say A, okay? So that means they want A over A wins against everyone, except for B, right? And by the way, these X's are because you can't compete against yourself. A wins against everyone, except for B, because B already B is the top choice. So you put ones there, and zeros there. And these are mirror images of each other, right? Like, this one translates to this zero, this zero translates to that one. But in my testing, you actually really do need both sides of the matrix in order to actually count the vote properly, which is sort of weird. I don't quite understand why, but you, you, you really do need the full matrix. You can't just use, like, half of it. Um, and then D is the next choice, so D wins over C, and C loses against D. Okay, so this is what the matrix would look like for this, right? And again, you could have the voting machine just print this out. But again, for the uneducated voter, like, people don't know what to do with this. They, they don't know what this means. And so, really, what you're going to have to do is the vote tabulation centers are going to have to transfer it onto this, either as, as they're counting the votes, or they'll have to transfer it onto paper, and then those will get sent off as ballots. I think it would be fine to transfer it on, right? Because, ideally, this is why I only wanted to use part of the thing, because now I ignore all these numbers. Um, just pretend this is blank again. Pretty much what you, the way you tabulate it is you add these all up, right? You add up all the squares in this. It's matrix addition, right? You add up all the squares in this, 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 right, from all the different ballots. So you add up this square on this ballot, and then you'd have another ballot, another ballot, and, and you did a total. Um, and then pretty much what you can do is, I believe, because we don't have any cyclical things, although there may be other problems that can arise, but I believe pretty much you will find that one candidate wins all one-on-one -on -one matchups, right? If you compare, that that's what it is, because you, you need to compare the two, right? So you need to take A versus B, A winning over B versus B winning over A. So, so you need, technically you don't need it, like you, you could just go by the total number of ballots, but not every ballot is going to have something for both things. So actually you do need to have the, the full matrix um and then you compare and if this number is bigger than this and ideally right in in a perfect world you'd have one right one row this way um like every number here is bigger than every number here and when you have a candidate like that then this is the winning candidate i believe that's how it works Correct me if I'm wrong. You can read more about it in the Wikipedia page. But pretty much, it's it's just matrix matrix addition. That I am certain about. But there there may be some additional things that have to be worked out, and it it doesn't always work like this. But if it does, then this is how it works. Okay, so pretty much that's how it works, right? And and you, and you get this final total for everyone. And so how you would tabulate it is again, you 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 would take this ballot, and we're gonna ignore these X's, um, right? And you'd take this ballot, and you'd say, okay, B's first. And, and then you'd, like, press a button, probably. A again, we're trying to operate under the principle that the, the, you know, the human is doing it, and the machine is checking rather than the other way around. But I can tell you that it would be <laughs> a lot easier if it, were the, if it were the other way around. Because you could just, the machine could tell you the matrix, and you'd be like, yes, that looks right. Right, and then again, you probably want those mechanical backups. You probably want, and these are a lot of things. If you have a ten by ten grid, that's a hundred, right? Minus minus the the middle one. So that's ninety individual like values that you have to tabulate. So if you have those like clicky things, like that's ninety things, right? That's a lot. I happen to think Condorcet is a, the best voting method, but it, it it is significantly more trouble. Obviously, you know, once you're done. You're done, right? They the they call in and they 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 send in the values for each of these, right? Which takes a little while, and then nationally they tabulate it and all that, and they come up with a winner. It's done, right? You don't have to send it back and say, "Hey, eliminate this this person now." No, this is not instant runoff. 
Um, so once you're done, you're done, which means vote tabulation centers across different time zones, right? They don't have to wait for others. They, if 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 the the numbers are skewed, I mean, obviously you can have more, um, more like individual like stations at a vote counting center so that each station has the right number of ballots. But if there's some hitch somewhere, then all the vote tabulation centers have to just wait until they get that result back. Um, so that is an advantage of Condorcet, um, and I don't uh, know exactly how the best way to tabulate it is while still ensuring that there's no room for the machine to maliciously or otherwise somehow, you know, mess up the count. Um, but that is definitely uh, something to be worked out. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about is uh, the actual logistic, the actual feasibility, right? How many people do you need to make this operation work? And um, I don't actually think it's that much. When you're dealing with instant runoff, right, for the first round, you don't really have to consider anything. You don't have to, you don't have to really give any thought. You just look at the top one, put it in the box, be done. But as, as the rounds go on, you do have to, like, actually think, is this person out already? Is this person out already, right? And there, there is a little bit more. Let's call it five seconds per vote, per vote counted, right? Which, because we're dealing with two people at one station, is the equivalent of ten seconds per person per vote. That's... It's not really a great way to think about it, but but it's mathematically equivalent. 10 seconds per person per vote, which means that you can count six votes in a minute. Um, so if you run that for um, an hour, right, then you have uh, six times 60, which is 360. You have um, 360 uh, votes per hour per person uh, that you're counting. Um, and we'll say that you get breaks in between. And again, the idea for this is to have people count over the course of, like, a weekend, right? There's, like, a weekend where people just, like, you know, and you get paid, right? I think you should be allowed to volunteer if you want, sort of, maybe. I mean, the, the primary incentive should be money, ideally, so that there's no room for... People don't apply that have malicious intent but that wouldn't really stop them and also again you know you have these machines checking so so it's it's there, there's not much room for that so i think you know but reasonable pay for people that want to pay um and you know it's just like a temporary it's not like a part-time job like this is like a temporary thing like this is something that like this isn't for something someone that's like looking for work, probably. This is, like, someone who already has a job and just wants some extra money on the side can just, like, for a weekend, right, they can just do this. And they, they can just count some votes. And I expect people would be willing to spend, like, three-ish hours doing this, right? Um, maybe, like, two and a half hours and, like, a half hour, to maybe, like, 45 minutes total is a break. So that's, like, one... That would be like one hour and 45 minutes, say, that people are actually counting votes. So times 1.75, right? That's each person is counting 630 votes. That's the idea, right? Which means that you need 1 630th or 1 over 630 of all the people in whatever place you're talking about to, to, to count the votes. One over 630 of, of those people. And I don't think you should even have to be a registered voter. Like, if you want to count and you're 16 years old, right, you can't vote, but you should still be able to count. It, it's a job, right? You, you should be able to do it. So actually, the, the, the pool for people that can actually count the votes is actually larger than the number of people that are actually count, casting the votes. But right, if if we do that, multiply by 100, that's 0.16% of people in whatever geographical area you're talking about 
to count the votes. I think that's um, completely reasonable. That's a completely reasonable amount of people. 0.16%. One out of every 630 people to be willing to count votes for a weekend. I think that's totally, totally reasonable. And this system can work. Now, for the Condorcet, it's a little bit more complicated. Again, um... Oh, the other important thing to remember with uh, um, instant runoff, which I forgot, is that you are counting some votes twice, or three times, or four times, right? Some votes are going to have to go from, right, are going to have to be counted eight times. Of, uh, you know, a few votes, but some votes are going to be have to counted multiple times because you take it out of the box, and you eliminate the top choice, and then you, like, do it again. So that is definitely a consideration. Um... So there's more, and uh, Condorcet would probably take even more time than that, even though it's only one count. It, it is a much more involved count. But I do truly think that it is something feasible that you could get enough people in a community. It's not even such a community because it's like an entire congressional district in places where that makes sense, like New Jersey or places where that doesn't make sense, like Montana, where it's much more sparsely populated, you, you would have fewer people, but then you have fewer ballots and you have fewer people, you know, counting. Um, but I, I really do think that it is a feasible thing that people um, will want to do to, you know, serve their country. Um, and I think um, we should... And again, um, in terms of cost, it, it would be... Probably more expensive. It's actually interesting because a lot of people say, oh, RCV would be so much less costly because it would only be one round. And th this is exactly what I was talking about in the main video. And some people say well, RCV would be so much more costly because it's, you know, a lot more infrastructure and they're forgetting that it's only one round um, <laughs> and that it's only one or the other because they don't consider that the other possibility is an option. But anyway, this probably would be more expensive than what we currently do for our infrastructure. <laughs> Right. You'd need I, I think there should be a pretty standardized voting machine, a pretty standardized systems. I mean, you know, these like boxes that like read the votes like, yeah, it would add up. But like it's a small price to pay for the second largest Democratic election in the world. Right. I think it is worth it. And I think it's something we should consider as feasible. Of course, then there's more debate to be had of do we actually want this system? And there's. You know, there there are opinions um, on that, and, you know, there, there are reasonable reasons for why it shouldn't be considered. Um, some of them are uh, more well-founded than others. <laughs> um, some, some opinions I've seen just make some generalizations and some claims that are, you know, sort of true, but they apply to other systems and yes uh something that people say oh well ranked choice voting you can still game the system you have, it's true you you can if you really really want b to win and d is your second choice you but you want really 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 want b to win you can actually stow d as your third choice or or a lower down choice to try to detract from d like th there there is there is some some gamification there but it's totally a different kind, right? Like, you have every right to do that, right? It's, it's your vote. But the point is, you're still voting for who you actually want. And yeah, it, like, not quite. But, like, the point is, you're not saying, I want A to win most, but I think B is the, will be the most popular for other people, so I'll vote B. Like, that, that one thing just... I think is totally stupid, and any voting system which promotes that is not good, is a f inherently flawed voting system, and you're not actually voting for who you want. You're voting just for, <laughs> essentially, for who other people want, which makes no sense. So, um, that's, uh, that's the video. I hope you, uh, uh, could stand my rambling. I don't do well without a script, um... But, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, um, thanks so much for watching. Uh, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.